All right, welcome back to the THB Strength Podcast. On today's episode, we are going to be talking about impulse. What specifically about impulse? I have no idea. Isaiah hasn't told me. He's gonna surprise me. But before we get into that, we wanna give a huge shout out to our sponsors at THP Strength. They are the premier jump coaching in the entire world. If you are looking to jump higher and get more athletic, then you need to go to thpstrength.com and sign up right now. If you don't wanna train, don't waste our time, don't waste your time, and don't sign up. Anything else? I don't know, it's pretty good. All right, so what, what, what do we have to talk about today? So before I get into the, the, question, the specific question I have for you, I guess we should define what impulse is. A lot of our people probably don't know what impulse is. Wait, why is it important? Maybe it's yeah. even more important. <clears throat> so when you're jumping, the physics equation that everybody always brings up is, well, I feel like the two things that is brought up the most is force equals MA, Newton's second law. Most people know that they've taken like high school physics. Uh, and then usually you get into power. Right, power is force, force times velocity. And I'll explain that as the reason you want to be explosive. It's not just about force, about how, how quickly you can apply force. But there has been a lot of, uh, I guess, research, Wait, arguments. Wait, power work? Work over time. Oh, okay. That's the same as the uh, force, force times, times time velocity. Times velocity. Okay, force times velocity. Yeah, that tracks, that tracks. So people will argue that power is actually not a good descriptor of vertical jump performance because you can it's it's work over time and you can sustain lots of work over a period of time and you'll generate a ton of power but it won't necessarily mean that you're that you're jumping high or that something's going to be uh what do you mean like on a bike or something like that yeah yeah like work over time you could you could generate how much power it was or you could figure out how much power is generated over 10 minutes riding riding on a bike. Oh, right. It's not a good descriptor of jumping that last, you know, point three seconds yeah, or whatever. Right. So then the argument is, it's not actually, it's actually not even an argument, it's just a fact, is that vertical jump performance is directly correlated to impulse. Not directly correlated. It is, it is. caused. Yeah. It is, it is impulse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then... I was looking at physics equations and stuff like that. And the other thing that determines vertical jump height, literally the one thing that determines how high you're gonna jump is vertical velocity at takeoff. Yes. So when you're at toe off of a jump, what's your final velocity? Right before your feet leave the ground and the higher that number is, the higher your vertical is gonna be. So then I did some, some shifting around of equations. Um, Initial velocity, assuming it's zero, usually it's zero oh, when you're thinking about a jump, unless you have momentum going into it. And then, but the equation for final velocity, assuming initial velocity is zero is... You know, initial velocity is not always zero, right? Yeah, that's what I meant. Like, if you have momentum going into, oh, into okay, the jump, okay. it might not be. Um, but it's essentially force times time over mass. So less you weigh, and the more force is being applied over a long period of time, which is the impulse, the higher you're going to jump. So then my question for impulse, you. So it's force times time over what Over mass. Is, over mass. So impulse over mass. final velocity, yeah. Okay, yeah. I got it, got it. <clears throat> so my question for you is, if you generate more impulse, and I, and I have, I kind of know the answer, and I know, and I also have. What is this? Is, is this a straw man? Are I you setting a, up a, a, a <laughs> logical fallacy? No, I'm saying, no, I'm saying because I'm saying our viewers probably don't know. Okay, okay. I, I can guess what you're probably going to say, and then I have my own hypothesis for it. Okay. But my question is, if impulse is direct, it is jump height. Right. And then you can generate, the more time you spend applying force, the higher you're going to jump. Why do we want to minimize ground contact times? Why do we see minimize ground contact times? And why is that? Like, I was looking at a study of there were elite sprinters and then the non-elite sprinters, and the elite sprinters had higher peak forces over shorter time intervals versus the non-elite sprinters had less peak force over longer time intervals. Wouldn't the ideal be a long time interval with really high peak forces? Right. So it, sprint, do you want to talk about sprinting or jumping? Let's do jumping because our viewers are probably going to be. All right. Do we want to cover sprinting? I think I think that would. I think if we do cover sprinting as well, it would be pretty enlightening, though. All right. So when you look at jumping and you have a motor pattern that is not dictated by, it, it is not 
the success of it is not determined by the overall time it takes, right? If you're in a game, then maybe that's different. But if you're a sprinter, then the overall time that you spend in the event matters, right? So, yeah. you know, hypothetically, if you can apply infinite force in, uh, let's say it's, I don't know, some insane amount of time, but you're still on the ground, then it, it doesn't matter. There's no, <laughs> like, yeah. uh, so. So with sprinting specifically. There's a time component that matters a lot. Yeah. So it's a balance between having really, really, because you could, you know, like you said, why not spend a ton of time on the ground and have super high peak forces? Because it's a ratio of how much force you can apply in a given amount of time. Otherwise you'd be bounding, right? That's gotcha. bounding. You gotcha. could do it in 16 strides or whatever if you so bound. Is, is sprinting not directly Sprinting is the to perfect. Peak force, uh, the area under the curve of each contact is optimized to allow at certain strides to allow for acceleration to continue down the track each contact each contact is different okay. so like an acceleration step isn't the same as a max velocity contact like out of the blocks you're yeah, gonna see different right. you're gonna see different impulse curves yeah. than you would if you looked at uh like force time curves than if you looked way later down the track so if you like hypothetically you know if you had a really really long period of time in the first stride and you produced a lot of force you're bounding that's what you're doing yeah. You're bounding and, and you can't have infinite time uh, or you can't have too much time because you're going. You'll, spe you'll spend too much time in the air too, right? Like, no, well, yes, but also you're looking at horizontal and vertical impulses. Yeah. They're not the same. Um, so you got to look at both vectors. But also you would, uh, your hips would be in front of your toe, right? Like you can't apply force without a reaction. Every action has an equal and opposite yeah. reaction. So when you apply a force to a mass, there is going to be a reaction. That reaction is your body moving over space. Yeah. So if you're applying force, your mass is going to be moving, right? Mm -hmm. And so you can't apply force past triple extension, right? Yeah. So if you apply a given amount of force in a given amount of time, you're, off, you're going to be off the ground. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so that's related to sprinting. And then there's also the time component, right? If you spend, if you, if you have too much impulse on the ground vertically, you will float upwards. <laughs> gotcha. So it, you also have to look at the horizontal forces. It's just that when we look at elite sprinters, they are on and off the ground and producing very high forces because eccentrically, they're braking very quickly. Yeah. So every action has an equal and opposite reaction. They have a very high rate of force development eccentrically when they hit the ground. So they're braking and able to decrease the amount of time that yeah. they're spending on the ground in that first half of so the eccentric you're contraction. It's like you're maximizing impulse within the time constraint. That you ha within that the movement constraint you have. The movement okay. strategy is going to dictate the time. Gotcha. The maximum amount of time. Gotcha. Because you could... Uh... Like you don't want to say, let me maximize time to change my movement strategy. It's my movement strategy is going to be what it is and time will be the result of the movement strategy. Yeah. You could try to maximize time, but <laughs> by doing that, uh, you have to change the movement strategy, assuming yeah. that effort is the same, right? Because if you just don't try as hard, then you'll increase time, but your force is going to go down, yeah. right? So you have to look at the movement strategy first and then look at time. The movement strategy is what changes time, and that's what changes force. Now, you could hypothetically, like, bound, right? That's yeah. going to change the force time curve completely. You could do a different type of run. Like, if you wanted to run and maximize time, then... Uh, just break the first half and your force is going to drop. It won't look like a sprinting curve anymore, yeah. right? If you try to maximize time, force is going to do something as a result. Yeah. It's because you have a, it's the interplay between, yeah. it's like time and force. Cause you could, and the movement strategy. Because like, like you said, you could hypothetically change time, but then your peak forces are going to change. 100%. And then you're just yep. going to just Then you're running slower. Yeah. Then you're not going to, and so if you're looking at jumping, what's interesting in this case is that you have as much time as you want. Your success does not determined by the amount of time the event takes. If you're yeah. just looking at dunking specifically, basketball might be different, but let's just say max jump height, right? Yeah. Like high jump, for example. Even that, you somersault plays a role because of time. But if you're just talking about jump height, like a height check or yeah. a dunking at one hander, you could, you should try to maximize time. So how do you maximize time though, is the question. The move, what happens to the movement strategy when you try to maximize time? Do you, it's gonna get bigger. Do you land? Because hypothetically, what if I did this? What if I stepped off a box, I landed, 
dissipate, dissipate all, all my force and then you and wait peak. for 30 seconds and then push up you would right you would just lose the peak forces at that point well right? one like, you wouldn't have a you wouldn't have a change in momentum if you correct for the system your body weight if you correct for your body weight yeah if all the momentum is dissipated you're you're going to decelerate to zero and yeah. then push back up and you could total the area under the curve and you know it's it won't be very meaningful yeah. right so at basically that point. you always have to just maximize for impulse you want to maximize you, you want to pick the I'm movement strategy jumping. there's a couple things that have to be assumed one that you're trying as hard as you can yeah two that you're trying to coordinate the movement correctly and maintain integrity of timing, yeah. right? And then uh, three, that's when you can start looking at changing time. And how you do that is by changing your technique. So yeah. why do we want a long penultimate step? Well, because if you have a long penultimate step, odds are you have a high acceleration or high mm -hmm. velocity of toe off. You have a high velocity of toe off, then when your plant foot hits the ground, that you're gonna have of to, the, of, the of the penultimate step. If you have more time in the air, two things happen. One, you can reconfigure your limbs into a better position. That's advantageous because that's going to give you more time, yeah. right? If you have a if you have a higher flight time, uh, as a result, you can pre-contract. If you can pre-contract, yeah. you can also produce more force on, when you do hit the ground, right? Uh, if you have a longer penultimate stride, you probably have more horizontal momentum. If you have more horizontal momentum then because you've had a lot of time on the ground to accelerate off that stride, yeah. right? If you don't have a lot of time on the ground on the penultimate step, you can't accelerate very much. That yeah. impulse still applies on the step prior. So if you have a big stride and you push off it hard, especially if you don't have an initial velocity off that step, there's just one stride, Yeah, uh, you're gonna continue to accelerate. If you continue to accelerate, typically athletes function more optimally because of rhythm. Rhythm plays a big role in jumping, mm -hmm. right? And coordination and kind of, uh, knowing how and when to apply a lot of force. So then when you do hit the ground, you're now going to yield more into a deeper knee flexion position. Yeah. Now that's good because it's gonna give you more time to push up positively. Mm -hmm. Now we're not even talking, that's just mechanics. We haven't even talked about the biology. And this is all assuming intent. Is 100%. 100%. Intent has could... to sit because peak force will drop if it's not. Exactly, because like, you could, like you, like the example we gave earlier, you could just try to spend more time on the ground, but your force will intent go will down. probably is gonna go down, and then force will go down as a as a result of that. And it's like the only way you can really maximize time on the ground while intent is high is by changing your technique. Yep, that's it. That's the only way. So if yeah. you're gonna, you could hypothetically yield more and slower in, into a deeper position. You could hypothetically do that, but so, peak force is gonna drop. Peak force will drop at that point. So I have a question and I want to give my hypothesis for it before you give your answer. So one of the cues that, I, that has helped me the most and that I see help other athletes the most, uh, last two steps as quickly as possible, mm -hmm. which is technically spending less time on the ground if you do it correctly. My hypothesis for why that's working, even though we want to maximize time because that's impulse. Right. My hypothesis for why that works is one, intent will probably be higher. Two, you have more speed coming out of the penultimate your plant, as your plant foot's hitting the ground. So you're eccentrically loading more and you get more out of your stretch reflex, force is augmented, uh, peak forces are higher mm -hmm. when it's less time. Or, or when you're cueing be on and off the ground quick, like fast last two steps. Right. Because I don't think on and off the ground quick. I think contact the ground. Get both feet to hit the same time and push I mean, It's up. like a sound. It's like boop, boop. Yeah. And push as hard as you can out of that position. Here's the thing. When your block foot hits the ground, your plant foot's already in maximum, maximum flexion. That happens. Wait, say that, say that sentence. When your block foot hits the ground, your plant foot is almost, oh, yeah. almost in or, or in maximum flexion, right? Yeah, like it's not going to keep going. So you could hype it. What, what if you just said, hey, I said, Isaiah, don't bend your knees on this jump? You can do that. You could do that. You'll just break all the momentum. There has to be a translation of your momentum forward and upwards to see. Yeah. Uh, you have to flex your knees to jump, right? Yeah. So what, what the force time curve would look like, it's going to look like a depth drop if you just hypothetically, you'll just dissipate all the energy. You'll stop all your momentum, your negative vertical velocity will go to, you know, it'll go from negative 0.03 to meters per second to zero, right? Yeah. And then 
there's no eccentric force, the muscle's done producing force. Now you're just holding an isometric condition yeah. in a poor leverage position, and then you could hypothetically push out of that, and you'd have infinite time, but because of the system, if you correct for your body weight for the system, you'll come back up to where there's no uh, net force and therefore yeah. no acceleration. So, all right, I wanna give the viewers, cause this is probably very science heavy, <laughs> <laughs> and I wanna give you guys actionable information. Um, when somebody looks at impulse, they're, you're gonna hear more time spent is better technically. But I feel like, do you agree with me that it's technically a bad cue Oh tell yeah. somebody I would never tell someone that, pushing I would the never ever ever use that cue ever. Yeah. I would say squat deeper. I would say allow yourself to get into deeper knee positions. Yeah. Feel your quad tension increase. Yeah. I would say that. I would never say try to spend more time on the ground. And it's ever. always with the assumption horrible cue, horrible cue. And it's always with the assumption I would I would in terms of like the importance of cues I think rhythm and timing is the most important thing. And then second most yeah. important would be intent and whatever cue allows you to have the most intent. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Like technically speaking, I think that there are big picture things that people struggle with because they can have good rhythm and they can have good time. They could have good timing and they could have high intent and they might still jump high. You know, look at Anthony Height. Yeah. Because big picture, oh, they're low and they're fast. And if they're low, they're going to have high time. Why do I always say the two things yeah. that are most important is if you're low and if you're fast? Because if you're low, your time on the force imp on the force time curve goes yeah. up if you're low. Yeah. That's really important, right? If you're fast, your eccentric rate of force development is going to go up, which I didn't get to, is going to load your tendon more, which gives you more efficient transfer of horizontal to vertical momentum, which means you're going to have a higher vertical velocity and thus a higher jump. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to be low and fast. However, Inside of that is where you'll start to see these little nuances happen with the penultimate step and things like that. But like you said, you know, if your uh, rhythm is really quick or, or uh, you know, your time, or better yet, your rhythm's really shitty, <laughs> yeah. or your, uh, your timing is really bad, or you, you don't get the plant and block foot down in, in the right position at the right time, it doesn't matter how low and fast you are. At that point, you're not going to be able to have the right movement strategy. So I would kind of view it in terms of, all of this stuff is assuming your movement strategy is solid, right? Once you have yeah. a solid movement strategy, the, the movement strategy is going to dictate the force time curve. Yeah. The force time curve doesn't dictate the movement strategy, right? I mean, I guess it does in a sense, but you don't, you don't think to yourself, I'm going to produce more force there. You're, you're obviously, you're trying to jump as high as you can. Of course you're trying to produce as much force yeah. as you can, right? I don't even tell, I wouldn't even tell myself that because what does that even fucking mean? I would say like jump as high as you can, yeah. run as fast as you can, or lift the weight as push up, push on the ground as hard as you can. Like that's yeah. meaningful, not produce as much force as you can. That doesn't mean anything. That's a really bad cue. Spend as much time as you can on the ground. That doesn't mean anything. That's why I, I would be wary of, when you get really into the physics, I think it's, it's good for describing why things happen. Um, but I would be very careful of trying to use it for like cues and I feel like a lot of guys a lot of athletes overcomplicate. yeah like you know we, we joke around about all the time with athletes that they'll, they'll be like <laughs> should my should my right ankle be at 45 degrees and then when should I start applying force with my with my right foot and then should I how should I roll onto this foot and then they're trying to think of like everything and like it's like they're trying to think of the science of That's jumping it, yeah. as they're <laughs> like yeah they're trying to think of like what's the full dissertation of John and Isaiah's jumping while know. they're on the fucking ground for point, the point three seconds, for point three seconds, <laughs> like bro, you can't think of a four-page paper. Right? You have point three seconds. Yeah. That's the that's almost the blink of an eye. So you can only think about one thing: push up. Yep. Uh, you, you always want cues to be as clear, concise, and concrete as possible for that reason that you don't have a lot of time. And of the thing that you're thinking of, or the cue that we're giving you, that's probably less of that point oh, point three. Yeah you know, uh, seconds on the ground or 300 milliseconds on the ground. You know, maybe it's only the first half I want you thinking about that, right? Like plan mm -hmm. on your heel. Well, that's 80 milliseconds of the 300 milliseconds is you focusing on you uh, planning yep. on your heel. So you don't... And then by then, it's like your brain can't process. Like for me personally, I can process like two cues yeah. at the same yeah, time. Yeah, everyone has a different amount they're going to be able to handle. And the, the, the movement that you do, depending on what it is and the time interval that it occurs, yeah. you might only have time to think about one. You know, like for upright sprinting, hit or sensations. People, 
I love sensations, cueing sensations, because you can feel things and process that a lot faster than you can process a word and think about what it means and, and apply it. Yeah. But if it's just a sensation, I just say dial that sensation up. That's way faster to process and have a response and see the, the outcome that you want for athletes. And even in myself, that's, that's what I do. If I know I'm uh, doing something wrong, I might start with a cue and go back and look at the video, like drive the knee. What yeah. does that feel like? When I drive my knee, what do I feel? When I drive my knee harder, what, what sensations do I feel more, right? Is that sensation good or bad? Is that gonna cause an injury if I keep dialing that sensation up? That's another thing, right? Like I could hypothetically dial up my high jump takeoff, more and more impact, more and more intense, more and more pop, but I'll pull my hamstring. I can dial it up to faster, but I'll pull my hamstring. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing a penultimate step and I try to dial up the sensation of my hamstring stretching, I will get hamstring tendinopathy or I will pull my hamstring in that situation. My knees, if I wanna feel a deeper knee flexion, right? Or if I need to get deeper in a jump, what am I gonna cue? I'm gonna cue, <laughs> feel your patella tendon more. But if I go too far, I'm either gonna jump lower or my tendon is gonna be in excruciating pain. So yeah. dialing up those intensities and dialing up those sensations is, is something, goes back to what we said yesterday. You gotta know your body too and know at what point, and I usually don't tell people dial up your sensation more than a seven or eight, because I know they'll usually get hurt yeah. and I don't wanna do that. But I think that's a really good way to cue if you're a coach or you're an athlete and you wanna feel something different. Like for a penultimate step, if I need to kick out more, I'll say, uh, I'll say, feel your hamstring stretch. Do you feel your hamstring stretch when you kick out? If I need the knee more, I might say, feel your rear, feel your back hip stretch. Yeah. Um, you know, or something like that. What, what's cool too is like, as you get more experienced, I think the transfer of weight room exercises to your jumping improves as well. And specifically, I'm thinking about- Like you learn how to connect the dots? Yeah, like, like last week, I did single leg hip thrust, uh, the max isometric. Uh, with the asymmetric hip thrust, asymmetric bilateral hip thrust. And I was telling John, whoa, that felt just like my penultimate. The exact same freaking sensation. So funny, because I've coached so many elite athletes and I've been like, what do you feel here? What do you feel here? And they're like, I don't know, I don't think about it. And they don't. But yeah. unless you ask them to pay attention and take note of it, then they can communicate it back to you, which is good, because yeah. I have Isaiah and I can do that. And you then, said something really interesting the other week, actually. You were like, when you were talking about that, you're like, it feels like that hit, and then I'm like floating in the air, and then it's hit, hit. And I was like, wait, let me try to visualize, like, let me try to wrap my mind around what that actually feels yeah. like. So if you had to describe what it feels like when you are going through what sensations you feel in your body when you're doing a 50.5 inch jump or you're jumping as high as you were last weekend, what do you feel on the penultimate step into the plant and block? Uh, through, so when I tested 50.5, I felt like I was running really fast. Then I hit my penultimate here, and then I literally, it, it went from like, I'm going really fast to now I'm gonna push myself so I'm even faster throwing myself at the ground. And it's literally, I'm throwing myself. Like I can't you throw yourself overstate, your leg? yeah, like I can't over, overstate how powerful that cue Like throwing a baseball? Does it's it like, feel like throwing a baseball? Yeah, it's like leg? a ball. You're the ball, I'm and your the ball leg is your arm. My leg is the arm. That's literally <laughs> how it feels. Or like, or it's like a catapult. Like my Do you leg feel is a like, stretch on it anywhere? Or tension? Uh, my hip flexor. Feel a lot of stretch I in your feel, hip flexor. Yeah, I feel. Yeah, like I literally throw my hip forward. The guys on Apple and Spotify aren't gonna see this, but I'm literally here, and then. So you're in a slight I knee bend. Throw, and you yeah, slight knee bend. I I'm not as low as I used to. I used to think I was like here. But it's more like I'm lowering Quarter squat through that step. And then once I'm like, it's like the reverse leg in a lunge, like a reverse lunge, the back leg. So once your knees, at, once your thighs like, yeah. per, like perpendicular to the ground. Yeah, like I'm vertical. like here. And then from here, it's like, yeah. and I literally, I, my chest, almost, it like feels like it goes vertical. And I used to, I watched freak jump technique when I was 16 in So high it's like school. a push stretch. Yeah, he, he always said, keep your chest up. So that's the, that's the only reason I keep my chest up now. But I literally go here and then it's like, and I literally feel a stretch. Right That's what I feel when right I have there. good technique. The <laughs> thing that happens though is I hurt my labrum because I don't have the mobility you have. So I've not over cued that too much. Yeah. But I do tell myself to like, it does feel like a throw. Like I want to feel as much wind in my face on that stride as possible. I want to feel as much, like, because what does speed feel like when you're moving really fast? You have a lot of money. You feel the, yeah. feel the speed. You feel the space around you moving really fast behind you. Yeah. Uh, you feel almost like the blur of it. It, it, it super fast. So it's like, mm -hmm. I want to feel like I'm moving even faster off of it and I'm 
like you said, you're throwing it, right? Yeah. So you're already having things, you know, go past you in your periphery and you're getting closer to the takeoff. It's like, I want to approach those things even faster. I want that sensation yep. of me moving through space to be even increased. And I want to feel that stretch so I know that I'm in the right position. Yeah. So then when you're in, when you're in flight, does it, do you feel like a almost I'm weightlessness, fall. I'm free, in fall? free fall? Yeah. Like I'm literally like the 16th depth jump. Is like you're just similar. waiting you're waiting i'm literally just waiting for the, like i'm in the air for a while and that's why we see like one of the biggest things with like inexperienced jumpers and then the elite guys is like the inexperienced guys aren't in the air for that long it looks like they're I just agree. stepping i agree they're just stepping they, hit, they don't they actually, go penultimate don't, it's like a jump off of the penultimate it's step. a step so i was thinking about this it's yesterday. a step versus a jump off of it i was or thinking hop about this the other day like we should be calling it penultimate jump yeah i know i agree step. i always say it feels like a jump if you do it right it feels like you're jumping into yeah. the takeoff yeah yeah it's almost like it's it's a weird jump though because you can't it's like a, it's not up it's like a one <laughs> foot broad jump yeah where you're yeah yeah where yeah. you're like still trying to stay balanced and jump that that's actually a really good way to word it it feels like you're like you know that, that but the thing is the broad jump to but the vertical. thing is i've tried to have guys stand on one foot and jump off of that back leg and they cannot connect the dots to be yeah. fair the person that we tried it with yeah I remember. was not very coordinated <laughs> but it does feel exactly like that and it's one of those things where if you're a good athlete, you're probably going to learn how to learn. You're going to learn how to acquire that skill without the, me having to go that far to use that drill. <laughs> the thing is, is like, when I'm thinking, so when I go with a short approach, it feels totally different. Totally oh, yeah, it will. Different. Yeah, it will. Because, and this is what I was going to say, too. The more speed you add, the more speed you add to the approach, this applies for bounding, this applies to one foot, the sensations you have are going to change. Why? Because you're not going to have as much impulse off of that step meaning you're not gonna have as much time. Yeah. The forces are probably gonna drop because you already have an initial momentum. You might still increase the velocity a little bit, but the step's gonna feel entirely different because the time that you're on the ground at that step is different, right? The yeah. rate of force you're applying on the penultimate step, the time you're on the penultimate step is gonna be shorter. The, is... the, the velocity you have into the step and out of the step is gonna be higher, right? Yeah. So it's gonna feel different. And so when you add steps, that's even harder, right? A lot of people can do it off one step. Yeah. But that, that's why you add another step and this then you do it again. This is going to sound weird as hell, but when I go short approach, so if I'm going off vert or one step, two steps is when I start being able, it starts feeling basically the same as my full approach. Uh, but it's almost like I use gravity to accelerate. Like if I'm like here and I'm like, in a, let's say I'm in a game and I, I, I get, I just have this. Like you have like, like, a, like a tiny short penultimate it's, step, like it's six It's like inches. I literally just let, like, you I like, fall into it. I, I completely get off of this leg and yeah, and then yeah. I just fall into it. You know, it's funny on a I'm force, not pushing if you into looked it. on a force plate on a counter movement jump, yeah. that's when the force drops below. Like if you're standing on the force plate, you'll see a line at your weight, right? So yeah. let's say, you know, let's oh, put and then the, it goes like, and then, and then the line will drop down below, you know, what it was because you're accelerating downward. You've applied less. Uh, you're not applying the same force into the ground that the ground's applying to you. You're yeah. now applying less force and therefore you will fall, right? Mm -hmm. And then you use that energy, that negative vertical velocity to load your tendon, right? Yep. By yielding and creating eccentric force, right? eccentric rate of force development, stretches the tendon, boom, you explode out of it. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you do a full approach, you have horizontal as well as the, you know, horizontal momentum as it's well like as the, the falling. Yeah, exactly. You're, an you approach are. is literally a supercharger. It is. On. But, but that's the thing. People are like, well, I don't know how to use it. And I'm like, well, this is a skill. It is a skill. It's not the same. It's not the same. They're related. Imagine but they're not the same. Imagine sound on an approach. <laughs> I can barely do it without an approach, let alone while I'm running. I would love that. That's another good idea. That next week, I decided, by the way, guys, this is somewhat tangential. I'm going to yell at Isaiah like I'm an angry college coach cursing at him if he misses a dunk and he'll be like that's a fucking easy dunk you bum <laughs> like like a pissed off college who's the coach that yells like that oh i don't he's know older. do you know what i'm talking about there's been a he, couple of he was like he one was of the first like guys to start it yeah oh man there's he used to throw lot. chairs Indiana on the sideline or not the, the hoosiers coach yeah in like 80s or not, yeah I, think. I know what you're talking about anyways that's what i'm gonna do but anyways i feel like that there's so much we could talk about more There's about literally, this. This can literally be a three-hour, like, we could talk segment about Segment about sensations of what, sensations. You, what you should cue. And then, and <laughs> what then there's to think all, about when you want to jump and higher. There's actually a whole – I was going to ask you, but I'm not, I'm not anymore. But there's a whole other subset of, like, the conversation about impulse and its implications for, with, for training. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's another a, one. I think that's more so where the physics understand – the understanding of physics helps. is not as much with technique, but how you plan training. Yeah, I like, think so too. Because it's 
when you look at a force plate, the force plate doesn't tell you if it's eccentric, concentric, or isometric muscle force is happening. Yeah. So that even plays more of a role because if you're just looking at a force time curve, it doesn't mean anything unless you're looking at it synchronized with 3D motion capture data, meaning you have an image that is moving while you move across the force time curve to show you what's happening with the body or the subject that you're looking at. So if you're a jumper, right, what happens when your foot hits the ground? At that, at that instant, what happens on the force time curve? Unless you have it synchronized with 3D motion capture, which is why labs are so expensive, because you need 3D mocap and you need a force plate set up that is synchronized, and you need to know how to look at the data, which is a whole different skill. Like, I could tell you what I need to look at, but I don't know how to use the software well enough where I could run the whole setup myself. You have yeah. to put markers all over, it's very difficult. Uh, but it, but it's very intuitive, and Dean actually has access to that if we ever wanted to do it in Arizona, full mocap setup. He's offered be, us to go. It would be crazy to like be in fifty point five shape and then do it in an environment where you can, where I can test fifty point five, but it's with mocap, mocap, force plates, all that. Oh, stuff. it would be very, 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 very insightful. And then the meta would be like after each cycle. To, like, every time oh, you test. Oh, absolutely. Cause absolutely. Because like, we, we noticed this about the first time I tested 50, and then the last time I tested 50, my ground contact time was way shorter. Oh, dude, it would be incredibly intuitive. It was, it was intuitive. similar jumps. Essentially the same height jumps. Like, it was the height check specifically. We right. That, which had the same flight time. or like, really close to the same flight time. But the ground contact times were different. And so this, just, is, this is what's really interesting is, like, research shows or demonstrates that you can get the same jump height from the same person two different ways. One when you're fatigued, one when you're not fatigued, the strategy you pick will be different. How you got that yep. force, how you got to that point will be different. Yep. So your question that you started at the beginning of the podcast that I didn't really fully answer or get to answer was, what happens when you have the same jump height but I decrease time? Shouldn't I jump higher with more time on the ground? Your peak force went up. That's the only yeah. way your impulse curve was steeper and shorter, which is better for performance on the court or anywhere else. Mm. Well, you, I, can do we keep, I, got, I can get yeah. off the ground quicker than yeah, you can. Yeah. So now what happens if we keep shortening that, right? Well, what would have to happen to get the same jump height is now the curve has to be steeper. Yeah. The rate of force development has to be faster. Yeah. The peak forces have to be higher, right? Which is better usually for everything else. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe you weren't as strong as you were when you first tested 50.5, meaning you couldn't handle the intramuscular force. You couldn't run as fast. You couldn't run as fast. You couldn't handle the eccentric forces as quickly I have, as you I have can another now. theory about that as well. And the other thing too, that is even more, or additionally that happens, is your tendons got more efficient. Yeah. They had to have. Yeah. I mean, there's no way you could ap apply force faster in less time. You, you got more force in less time. Yeah. That is the opposite of what muscles do. Yep. Muscles do not do. get more force in less time unless it is eccentrically and maybe isometrically when you're increasing force on a ramp protocol. Yeah. Meaning his tendons stored more energy quickly. It's not like his concentric force went up. No, his tendons just got better at storing that energy faster and more efficiently. So when he did push up concentrically, yeah. you got a shit ton of force out of so it. So there's another, there's another variable uh, that I was thinking about because somebody told me, they pointed this out. They were like, why is your... Uh, why are you higher up? Like your range of motion on your jump isn't as high as in, and your penultimate like looks different. Like I'm, I'm higher up and me tearing my, my Fucking IT band, yeah. There's another variable. What if you never tear that? Cause like I eventually, this whole year, I've been, I, like I have been scared to load low on my jump, like yeah. my range of motion. I agree. And then I think that has had, I mean, less range of motion, less time. I have to spend less. So yeah, but you, the you basically force. shifted it and said, look, I don't have the luxury of time anymore. Yeah. So I'm gonna favor peak force less time, which makes sense. If you're in less of a range of motion, yeah, like guys like Anthony Height, he has less compression on the, on the hip, but also in terms of force muscularly, your force can go up. Yeah. You can have more peak force. You're in a better leveraged position. You can produce more eccentric force. Your intramuscular force might've been, maybe it was higher. Maybe you had better cross bridging. Your, intra, your intramuscular force had to go up. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that's probably what it was. You're probably in a better length tension relationship, probably had more mm -hmm. cross bridging, more eccentric force in that higher position, and you were able to do it in less and time. And it makes sense. It's now, only marginally. Now it, well, not back, really. It was, what, 20 milliseconds? Yeah. That's yeah. still kind of a lot. Now, now thinking back, it, it, it also makes sense that I would get more out of power work. Yeah. If I'm not. As, and elastic work. If I'm having to spend less time on the ground on my jumps now. 
Yep. Because of my hip. That's actually really enlightening. Yeah. That, that tracks. Yeah, That's yeah. maybe why you're following more traditional periodization strategies and when we were like, mm -hmm. whoa, plyos are working. Whereas yeah, because well, you have to. <laughs> yeah. Before it was like, well, I can go deeper and so I will use more force. And then I'm not actions. as low on my squats too. That's transferring a little bit more this time. Like, it's really interesting. So now all we got to do is just get you so healthy you can get to those four ranges of motion. And yeah, like now what happens. All the speed. Yeah, like now what happens if I get lower and. <laughs> <laughs> probably the world just probably probably get a ripple in the four in the time space continuum and uh probably just Teleport. everything ends yeah. everything ends i don't know <laughs> anyways if you guys enjoyed this podcast uh make sure you like comment and subscribe if you were confused i'm sorry i have a tip actually if you don't understand anything the point where you got confused pause it and look up whatever term you don't know yeah that's how i I learned about this stuff. It's probably how John learned. Yep, he was, yep, I think yep, you mentioned yep. that the other day that you look up. Look up anything you don't know from a reputable source and... You just fucking Google it. Yeah, <laughs> literally just Google it. You don't know what impulse is? Google the equation. Oh, you don't know what force is? Look up the equation. You know? Yeah, easy <laughs> and, and enough. The, and that you will learn. And the, it'll be time well spent. So Perfect. Anyways, like, comment, subscribe. If you want to jump higher and you want to work with two of the most knowledgeable and also the world record holder in vertical jump and a coach who is practiced both in science and with anecdote, uh, go to teachmestrength.com and sign up right now. We are on a massive discount. It will not stay here. We cannot afford to keep it this price. We will eventually have too many people. And so we're gonna do this for as long as we can. Uh, it was something I wanted to do and he wanted to do. If you guys are serious about getting better, go there. Yeah. Thanks guys. The, cut, the cutoff is happening soon. We're gonna lock, it's closer we're than gonna you think. It yeah. <laughs> also, if you're on a podcast platform, give, give us a five star. Five baby. star, baby. Five star. Oh, 38.